So, so we still have one more presentation uh, from the uh, NG Studio from ESRI USA. And uh, let's invite uh, Nanju Li to present the work, understanding and uh, analyzing the characteristics of the third place in urban design, a methodology for discrete and continuous data in environmental design. Sure. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much to uh, having me here and this opportunity to present my work. And my name is Nam Juli. I'm founder of NG Studio, which is specialized in computation and design and visualization. And I also work as software engineer at Ashley, which is Jai's company. Um, my presentation's topic is about understanding and analyze the characteristic of a third place in urban design, particularly focusing on the methodology for discrete data and continuous data in environmental design. Um, with the rapid uh, development of uh, data-driven technology, many opportunities have risen to understand and characterize urban context. This project tries to address the methodology to understand a place in an urban setting through the lens of third place and mobility based on the workable distance. To capture the process third place data uh, fetched from the, um, the Google Place and based on the given location, the project, um, you know, um, discuss two different types of uh, data structure to process discrete and continuous data and representation of the third place. In a specific um, location of a city could be characterized by representative query. Uh, it's identified chart as a representative of understanding a designate area could compare with other chart in different place. This methodology allows us to distinguish the constitution of third place based on distance among place, enabling us to develop design strategy to differentiate or accord the site based on mobility. The third place refers to the social environment between you know, two user around a surrounding place, like a home as a first place and a workplace as a second place. These places are settings such as cafe, um, club, park, library, and restaurant, and so on. Well, you spend our daily life except for the first and second place. This diversity and um, um, density of the third place could become a parameter and characterize a place. Energy is also an uh, essential resource in modern society. Um, every major city is an um, earth uh, consume on the earth and consume diverse types of energy. And as you can see on the, the image on the left side is the most, uh, the, the major energy constituents for the transportation things. And on the, the image on the right side and the urban population is more significant than rural areas and the population increased the consumption of energy for transportation. However, the energy use uh, for transportation per person in low density is higher than urbanized city with a high density because citizens need to use transportation to access their third place in their daily life. So this is the third place visualization by Google Map data. So as you can see, we can clearly see some pattern, some group of the third place population in a Cambridge and Boston area. So in order to produce this kind of third place data, so I utilize the two different types of data structure majorly. The first one is the pixel uh, data structure, uh, which is like a two-dimensional uh, data matrix, consists of individual pixels that could have um, diverse data internally. Um, as a parent of each pixel in a hierarchy, the pixel structure govern and their uh, controlled compute the emerging the new data by talking with the neighbor, uh, the, the, um, the data set. So what I mean by that is basically the the position data, you know, in general, they have like a particular discrete data. So sometimes we need to interpolate, interpolate this particular position data, their, uh, their, their neighborhood to make them a better, you know, the compute for the data. Um, this is the other example of the multiple layer of the 2D pixel. So let's say we have a, a 
multiple types of the data, and then we can, um, you know, the layout on a, based on the layer, and then we can um, make some special processing to talk and in, uh, the merge and flatten the multiple layer into one simple, like a two-dimensional um, data set, which representing the city or district. So as a different technique, uh, a, a graph data structure also utilized in that project. The graph structure is a sort of a mathematical object that consists of the node and edge, and is widely used to represent um, relation data structure. Um, the street network of the urban street or a highway or a survey map are example of objects. Those are um, very you know, um, closely assembled their physical form. So in order to calculate the actual uh, distance work from, from cost, we need to convert like the, the uh, continuous data uh, into the, um, the graph data. So I, uh, as a second, second data process, I utilize the graph things. And also, as you can see, the graph has a very particular characteristic in terms of the troubles. So some data, uh, a node could have like a, a one-way tree on the, the other ones could be had as a round tree. And the individual node has some their, their data uh, properties. So we can basically calculate the one single source of tooth as a weight by computing multiple um, hierarchy based on the issue of weight. So um, this is the uh, query. There's a lot of query. So maybe it become like a noise. So I um, reduce um, some of the um, quality reduction. So as you can see, there's a lot of sort of place, but we can like uh, categorize into six um, areas so that we can get the more um, precise and clear the, um, the compute process. So in order to um, execute this kind of methodology, so I picked the uh, four different types of area in Cambridge area. So which is, a, I mean, the Cambridge is a very unique area, but the four designated place has a very um, differentiate each other. So basically, for example, the Harbour Square has a lot of tourists and students and the amount of buildings, which is sort of isolated. So a lot of students is there and Kenda Station or Bilber Center has their own like a biotech and uh, some big giant company there. So um, this is a sort of the methodology um, demo. Um, as I can say, we try to analyze sort of place data based on the distance. So I parameterize the distance between five, 10, 15, and 20 minutes to workable place. And then what kind of sort of place is accessible or not? So the third place is actually the point data. And then we basically pre-process the point data as a, like a pixel because the one place actually you know, affects their neighbor, right? So we, we try to mimic this kind of uh, um, ecosystem. And then uh, as a, at, the end, at the end of the, of the process, we, uh, the, the network uh, analysis is consume their own area and then compute based on the distance, as I said, like five, 10, 15 minutes. So this is the, the other example, how I um, convert a um, you know, discrete data to the continuous data. So there's a one particular area could have different types of uh, data sets. So for example, like, like slopeness or number of sort of places or restaurant or coffee shop and things like that. So we actually give some kind of weight and then the way is to talk to their neighbor as like a propagation uh, system so that we can get like a you know, continuous uh, smooth the data around their neighborhood. So this is uh, the sort of last, um, the, the methodology that I use for this project, uh, the, um, the paper. So as you can see, we can designate a particular area and then it's set to the closest node and then travel the older network and then print out the, the, the third place based on the sixth category that we already you know, processed. So you can, as you can see on the right side, you can see the number thing. So this is uh, um, the result. Let me close this. So um, there's a, uh, the number of the, the third place within the sixth category based on the three different um, the measure system, like a five, 10 or 15 minutes. So if we actually overlay or overlie each other on top of each other, so we can see some like a pattern and some like, um, you know, the, the shape of the star shape. Yeah. 
and also the down there. So we again uh, the discrete data couldn't represent only one particular area. So we need to think about like a, the more um, you know um, the place with the, their neighbor. So this is the like a heat map representation of the star plot as you can see. And also, um, there's a two way of uh, looking at this uh, star diagram, I guess. So first one is uh, we can see, uh, uh, you know, the number of the number of the third place. And the other way around is um, the shape itself. The shape itself has a very unique um, um, characteristic. As you can see, the Melbourne city here is a, for the five minutes, this uh, workable place, it has a very rapid, like a facility and, um, the health of things, but as, as the distance is getting bigger and bigger, so maybe the people living there, they need to drive or otherwise they need to walk like more than 10 minutes, things like that. Um, so I have a simple like a wrapping video. I don't know how can I uh, reduce the uh, sound track, but I can, um, let me, I think it's okay. <laughs> so, as I said, I have a third place data. This is the entire third place data, so we can see some pattern. Sorry. And then I do some color reduction because there are so many noise. So, we need to get the, um, some you know, particular uh, algorithm to process the third place data. And then we have some network analysis. This is not just about the distance space, it's more about like a weight-based uh, uh, the cost system. And apply. So this is the examples. So we can uh, poly the third place based on the different uh, the, the distance, like a five or 10 or 15 inch vertical distance, as I said. This is the, the example how one particular point affects their neighbor based on the law. So we can, so for example, like a crime data is not affected their own particular areas. The crime data is actually doing in the, their own district or area. So we need to calculate the urban data. Um, so this is the example of we, how we um, represent sort of place data as a sort of like a stat plot. So as I said, this is a result. I mean, with this kind of result is the shape itself is also very unique. And also, as I said, the shape is a sort of a different types of representation of that particular area that you, that you uh, select. So actually, as a conclusion, um, understanding the uh, density of the third place based on walkable distance could alleviate the characteristic of city, which allow designers to develop the decision making process by comparing with different location or the past of the same location. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, uh, do we have any questions from our meeting room? I posted a yeah, question. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Sorry. I posted a question there in the chat, but I, I'd be happy to, to state it um, verbally uh, in Amju. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess my question has to do with, so I, I, first I should say it was a, um, a great presentation and some really lovely uh, visualizations um, uh, of, of, of your subject matter. Um, I guess my question has to do with the kind of start of the, of the, of the data visualization process where you decide what constitutes a third place and what does not. And I, I guess I find myself questioning, especially in this time that we find ourselves in, um, uh, I haven't really left my house for a third place in months. <laughs> um, so I kind of started by thinking like, are we still gonna have third places in the post pandemic era? Or how does this going to make us kind of rethink what constitutes a third place and what does not? And that more broadly, that I kind of took a step back, um, more broadly speaking, it seems like the what constitutes a third place is culturally and temporally specific like what i can what i consider to be a third place now in the middle of a pandemic pandemic is different than what i did a year ago and it's probably different than i will consider to be a third place 
a year from now, by the same token, these are culturally specific categories. What um, you know, a person in Cambridge would consider to be a third place in their life would be very different than someone in Seoul, for example. Um, so I wonder how your visualizations might begin to reveal these kinds of um, these kinds of differences over time or over kind of different cultures. Correct. Um, thank you for asking this question. So um, the assumption of this pre uh, the project is uh, we actually rely on the, the Google the uh, third place data, so which is actually not represented, you know, the, the real third place context in the city. And also, as you can say, like we have a different culture and then based on this sort of, uh, you know, rapid uh, pandemic, I think we can, I think we need to uh, um, uh, define what is the third place, I think, before starting, I guess. But according to book, the third place that I refer in this uh, our paper is uh, it's more about like in the, between place, like, you know, workplace and um, the house. So where we can meet and then hang out and communicate just like in a Zoom meeting. Also, it, it's a sort of a, uh, we can consider this is a sort of place and you know, happening things. So I feel like, um, um, I don't know uh, whether I'm fully understanding your question or not, but I feel like the, the third place is a sort of, uh, it's really hard to define, um, you know, to actually, you know, make the third place as a tangible data that we can actually you know, allocate on the uh, map in a gra geographical way. So, um, yeah, I mean, the data is, uh, I think it's really important in, the, in this project. And then um, we, I think we, I, I need to more I think about like uh, the definition of the third place and then how we, even if we couldn't get the right third place data, I think there's a lot of way to, you know, measure or collect the third place data um, the, uh, indirectly things. So, yeah. <laughs> Any other question? Uh, yeah, uh, maybe. Yeah, actually, we are uh, we're kind of behind schedule, so uh, we don't have time for uh, for, uh, for 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 quite another question. But uh, we're going to have another uh, panel discussion session uh, for all our eight present presenters, and uh, so I uh, we're, we're behind the schedule, so. Uh, we're going to shrink the time from 30 minutes to 20 minutes. And, uh, but before that, I think uh, there are still some questions left for our presenters that was uh, uh, asked by our uh, audience outside the meeting room and uh, inside. And uh, I think may maybe it's uh, also very interesting to share some of the questions uh, in uh, uh, right now. So. Uh, so let's start the, our panel discussion. Uh, please, all the presenters, turn on your uh, video, and uh, we can we can have a group discussion right now. And uh, and also, please, Professor Yuan, participate in our discussion. And actually, uh, I think it's a it's a very uh, uh, very good uh, session. I, I mean, I, I learned a lot from from you. Uh, it's a, uh, all, all of you are using very advanced uh, measure uh, algorithms or trying to develop very practical and the powerful tools for in, in design or construction practice. And uh, actually, I, I feel like that uh, the digital design research evolves very rapidly. And uh, nowadays we see a lot of uh, in GAN and the, and the neural network researchers and also a lot of very practical, very detailed and practical uh, tools developed. And uh, so my question is, uh, although these tools are very powerful, do you uh, encounter any difficulties or what do you think is key to the development of our research area like uh, digital design, digital like analysis or construction, all these problems, what's the frontier? And what's the difficulty that maybe we were facing or you are trying to solve in the future uh, research? And also, I think this is also questions also related to a question from our one of our audience. Uh, I will read out. Uh, this is a question towards all speakers. 
Could you describe in more detail how do you envision the marriage of machine learning and architectural design in the future? Is it going to be a tool that promote inclus uh, inclusivity or will it become a barrier for designers who are not digitally uh, literate? literate? Yeah, uh, so that's my question. I think uh, all our presenters can share your opinion uh, with our audience, like one by one. And uh, if you're ready, you can start. Yeah, I can go first because no one. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, so I'm not a uh, machine learning uh, expertise, but I had several you know, projects with the machine learning things. But my understanding of the machine learning in the design practice is uh, it's not like um, the developing the special network, but more about like understanding what the network does and then how to prepare you know, data set to take advantage of the network system correctly. So, um, you know, there's a lot of like a specialized network, like pix to pix or like a um, you know, ranking system, or I mean, there's a lot of uh, you know, networks, computer science and statistical people develop their own sort of uh, methodology. But um, as a designer, so I feel like, I think we need to understand what we really want, just rather than take advantage of the uh, technology because it's just simply a fancy or like a nice. But I mean, you know, in terms of, uh, I mean, as, a, as my professions, we dealing with a lot of urban data and geographical data. So in this particular data set, for example, sometimes uh, the, you know, I don't know, as I said, I'm limited experience, but sometimes the deep learning is a, it's like a shows like a little less performance compared to simple linear regression or polynomial regression. I mean, with the deep understanding of the pre data process, uh, as I said, the data process you need to understand the, what the network gonna consume the data. So let's say to uh, make my, my long story short, I guess um, the, as a designer for design practice toward the machine learning uh, understanding is more about like uh, understanding network and then prepare the right data structure or right data image or whatever. And then we need to clarify what is the input what is the output. And then this kind of input and output is goes to other design process or decision making process things. So I think um, this is just uh, my understanding of uh, looking at the uh, machine learning in design with the limited experience. Thank you. Um. Can I make a comment? Yes, please. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I think um, yeah. This is really a great question uh, about like uh, the inclusion of uh, machine learning and advanced in design. In response to uh, um, what Najim just said, um, I think one motivation for me to use machine learning in design is the word um, understanding, or the word that a lot of like data scientists use in the data science projects as interpretability. Um, so I think um, from from the perspective of designer, I think somehow design some is usually captured as a black box process, and I think machine learning is kind of like pre providing a way around for people to understand like the the neural basis of uh, of design, uh, which is like a biological somehow like could be metaphorically uh, understand it as a um, biological neuroscience process, which we do not yet uncover. But machine learning provides like a simulation modality to this kind of like black box. Um, so yeah, this is my perspective using machine learning to increase how we understand the design ourselves. It's actually through machine that we kind of like train understand ourselves, like understand human. So yeah, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I, could you, I was wondering if you could repeat the question, I guess, as framed to, you know, what uh, my more, pra our more practical application is, uh, isn't actually touching on machine learning. I guess you could, uh, you could skip I, me on I this see, one or. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, my question is, uh, although we have developed, uh, we're using very uh, sophisticated and uh, very good performance tools uh, there are still some challenges uh, for the for the development of uh, like uh, design, construction, and uh, analysis or investigation in the future. So, what do you 
think uh, uh, will be the, the challenge in the future or what are you going to do? What are you going to, you think is key for your future explorations? Yeah, absolutely. What are, I guess I'm going to interpret that as, you know, what are some of the biggest blockers uh, for us uh, in, in development of some of our software? Um, and, and I would say, you know, some of that is hardware restrictions and some of that is software restrictions. Um, I think that, you know, the technology is growing so quickly. It's incredibly exciting to see. Um, but there are still many limitations, especially on some of these, you know, headsets. The, it was a very good question previously uh, about why are we using mobile devices on a construction site when, you know, a, a head mounted display might be a better opportunity there. And, you know, really that has to do with cost and distribution. We, we, we can't give a head mounted display to every single general contractor and subcontractor on a construction site. Um, when all of them, you know, many of them already have tablets that they're using, they can reuse that, uh, repurpose that device in a new way to increase efficiency on a construction site. Um, you know, so it, it's really both a software and a hardware problem, in my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, somehow the practical problem uh, is really difficult to to deal with actually, uh, even with this uh, advanced uh, neural network and uh, machine learning tools, the, but the practic uh, some some of the practical problems are most difficult to solve. And uh, yeah, that's uh, it's based on a lot of uh, uh, optimization and also a very good understanding and the uh, the the, the, the strat how to structure in the problem. I don't know if I, I mean, I hope I'm not hearing that people think that drawing bowling pins and strawberries is not practical in some way, but uh, uh, I, uh, I I could take up the question. Uh, I'll take it back to machine learning, I suppose. Um, uh, there was a, really two parts, like what are the, what are the immediate challenges? And then is there a kind of, what, will, will there be a barrier? Uh, what, how will machine learning tools relate to novice users who are not deeply embedded in those processes. So I'll take that one at a time. So one, like the immediate challenges, um, I think it's notable that there, were, there was more than one project that we saw in this session that um, struggled with the, uh, the, the kind of 2D to 3D um, translation. Um, and a, a lot of that has to do, and I mean, I, I should say struggled mightily. I think I, I really enjoyed the projects and I think that um, they were quite strong. I think it more speaks to a position that we're, we're all in as design technologists in architecture uh, who are experimenting with a new technology that we don't uh, have direct access to. None of us are machine learning engineers, right? Um, I assume, uh, I'm not. So uh, I don't have direct access. I'm, I'm in my own way a novice for these things as well. And the simple fact is they were designed for other purposes. I mean, these are these are technologies that come out of computer vision. And so they are made to operate on formats that are amenable to computer vision problems, images um, and image sequences. And architects don't generally work with that particular format. Um, and so I think what's needed overall is an investment uh, in, two, in, in two things that would further the state of the art and architectural um, applications concerning machine learning. One is underlying algorithms that deal with a broader range of representations that are more akin to what we do as architects. So vector representations uh, and 3D representations such as uh, 3D graphs and meshes and that kind of stuff. And there's been some work in that regard, um, uh, but it's not completely accessible to folks like us yet. Um, and then second, uh, we need better data sets, like kind of fundamental data sets, uh, benchmark data sets, the way that they have in computer science uh, there's no standard representation for a building. Uh, it, the, the representations that we use as architects is multivariate. There's many, 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 right? There's plans and there's 3D models of different formats and there's programmatic descriptions and blah, blah, blah. I mean, we don't have any kind of standards in that way. And I think that developing those standards collectively would go a long way to furthering the state of the art. Um, so those are the two big challenges I see ahead of us. And I would love to work together with anyone who wants to help tackle those things. Um, the second part of the question about access, um, I don't know. I mean, this is how things go in the world, right? I mean, like this is not the 
first time that a transformative technology has been introduced to design culture. And there are people who are deeply embedded in it or relatively like for our group. And there are those who are less, um, less so. And, um, you know, it, it will go how it goes. I think that we, the, those who are less deeply embedded will have less access to customizing things and changing things around for themselves. They'll have less power in this scenario. Uh, and those who have deeper access will have more power uh, to change things as they like. But with that power comes in, and like, it, it's a trade-off because you be, as you become more deeply invested in these things, you also kind of buy in to the fundamental assumptions of any given structure, right? You become an expert and that means uh, like you do things the way the expert does them. And so um, on the one hand, I think it's not gonna be any different than any other thing in that regard. On the other hand, I have a high, as I said in my talk, I have high hopes for machine learning as a technology of the tacit, um, which is not something that, that, which is a fundamental failing of digital design media as it's currently conceptualized from 3D models to parametric design to, to BIM. These are all technologies of the explicit, right? And as a designer, it's very uncomfortable to have to be so explicit on everything all the time. I wanna draw building pins and strawberries, right? As an early stage, like kind of frou-frou designer, right? Not like as you know, a serious person who builds things, but like I, I wanna experiment, like creativity thrives on the tacit and designers need that. And I think that there's a possibility for machine, the CAD tools based on machine learning to begin to address this missing piece of what we yearn for as designers, which is uh, something unspoken, designed by example, designed through uh, tacit uh, suggestions rather than explicit statements. Um, so I have a lot of hope in that regard. And that might play into the, the person's question about um, a novice user. A novice person can can just say what they want through example rather than writing a script or whatever, right? So I don't know. I'm of two minds of the, of the second question. I, have I think it's very, very intuitive, thank you. I have yeah, a question. Uh, so Kai yeah. mentioned uh, the second section, you also talk about like you know, standardized the, the data set that we can benchmark to train the networks basically. But I'm just curious, like, uh, my understanding of you know, the machine learning for the computer science side, basically they try to predict the future based on their past because they need to sort of, um, you know, very standardize the aim, you know, increase the accuracy, things like that. But I think, do you think uh, if in case that we have this kind of standardized data set, how the machine learning things, you know, dedicate the design area rather than fitting one particular, you know, thing. So I think this is my question. Why, what, what do you think about, uh, you know, the standardized data for, for benchmark for training for the network in design area? So do you really need to like sort of uh, have a, you know, medium or optimal um, design set or you know, the network or training, training things, because we are dealing with like something we need to design, you know, some designing, some things that we never experienced before, right? So in this case, maybe the train set maybe become blocker. So this is my question. I love that so much. Thank you, that's awesome. So that um, I, know I might quote you, so I'm gonna say it again. The, you said that the, because of these, well, it's a different thing in computer science because what they want to do is predict the future based on the past. and Lord, do they get into some trouble with that, <laughs> right? I mean, like it's so dangerous because of all the bias, uh, there's, bias there's a problem with bias, right? Um, but that's not our position as designers at all, is it, right? Um, I would say as designers, we want to play with the past to construct the future. And that's a completely different thing. Um, and so you're right, like those, those benchmark data sets, they're not for the, the things that the computer scientists would use them for. They're for something else. They're for us to play with. But I think we still we still need them. Um, thank you. I'm seriously going to quote you on that. Thank you. I'm answering the question. Thank you, Hi.